Hi, this is Eric Michael Floyd, Master's in Clinical Psychology, Neuropsychology Concentration. Uh, I was going to read uh, something that I was thinking about from the other day. Uh, this book called Half the Human Experience, The Psychology of Women, 8th edition, this is from undergrad. This is by Janet Shibley Hyde and Nicole Elsquest. Just going to read chapter one. Uh, it's up to page twenty. Uh, this book I, uh, was an elective class, and I chose to take it, and uh, is really an eye opener for um, many perspectives on um, bias, on testing, on uh, positive fun facts, uh, really interesting fun facts. And I'll go ahead and read some of it now. <clears throat> Very uh, impactful class for me. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the preface. A new edition and a new author team. Janet Shibley Hyde has authored this textbook since the first edition appeared many years ago. She felt that it was time to add new blood with the contributions of a new but already stellar research for its last teacher or slash teacher, Nicole Elsquest. NEQ earned her PhD in the psychology department at the University of Wisconsin in 2006, working with JSH, Janet Shibley Hyde, as her mentor. We think about the psychology of women, about research, and about teaching in very similar compatible ways, and the transition to co-authors has been seamless. NEQ adds the perspective of younger feminists as well as her own passion for the topic. Our basic goal in preparing this new edition of Half the Human Experience has been to provide the text on the psychology of women and gender written in a way so that it is accessible to undergraduates who have little background in psychology, perhaps only an introductory course, yet also challenging and thought-provoking for senior psychology majors or women's studies majors. We want students to feel excited to learn about the psychology of women. We hope that our excitement about the field shows through for them in the book. This is truly one of the most meaningful courses that a student can take. Those, with, those who teach it can feel a deep pride in the body of research from which we can draw. Three characteristics of this book, its readability, comprehensiveness, and scholarship have been well received in previous editions, and we have worked to retain and improve those features. We believe that the readability of texts is a feminist principle. On one of the goals of feminists has been to demystify science, and as part of that effort, we demystify psychology, including the psychology of women. Our goal, therefore, has been to provide a text with solid, cutting-edge scholarship, clearly explained so that students can grasp it, indeed, be captivated by it. And just uh, one point that I learned in this book was that uh, feminism, at least the contemporary definition of feminism, is actually equality between all groups, not only uh, women, but gays, minorities, uh, uh, different cultural, religious um, persons and and the like. So that was one uh, uh, such thing that that I, I held on to. I remembered because uh, some people may think uh, uh, and, and conflate it with uh, extreme feminism or or something like that. But that's not what it is. It's uh, equality between all groups of people. Each of us has taught psychology of women numerous times using this textbook. We use those experiences to polish and improve the book. 
For example, if students have problems with a question on an exam, it is because that passage of the book is not clearly written. Uh, is it because that passage of the book is not clearly written? If so, we fix it. Both of us has a deep understanding, have a deep understanding of what is fascinating and what is difficult for students. And we put that knowledge into our crafting of the book. What's new in this edition? We have kept the chapter names and numbering the same. But we have thoroughly revised each chapter. Here are some of the highlights, although we can't begin to list all of the additions and updates. I'm just going to jump straight into the book here. Uh, it has chapters 1 through 16. Uh, actually, let, me, let me just read it really quickly. We added, in chapter 1, we added new coverage of girls' experiences of sexism. Chapter 2, a new edition on intersectionality has been added to part of the chapter on feminist theory. We added a discussion of third wave feminism. I think that's what I'm referring to. Chapter 3, a new section on implicit or automatic stereotypes in the IAT was added. Uh, I think that one is from Harvard. Chapter 4, we added a new focus box in, with, in which Daryl Wing Sue's concept of racial microaggressions is introduced and then extended to greater microaggress microaggressions and sexual orientation microaggressions. All demographic data were updated with the 2010 census. This book, by the way, came out in 2013. It's the eighth edition of this book, Half the Human Experience. Chapter five, the terms cisgender, cis women, and cis men are introduced and defined. Chapter six, we added a section on gender differences in emotional intelligence. New research was added on the gender stereotyping of emotions. Emotional intelligence, that's also something I learned about in uh, graduate school as well. Um, chapter 7, new research was added on children and adolescents developing perceptions on gender discrimination. New material and mechanisms by which parents engage in gender socialization, channeling different treatment, direct instruction, and role modeling. Coverage of the report of the APA Task Force on Sexualization of Girls. New material on fat talk and on ethnicity and body dissatisfaction. Chapter 8. The section on gender differences in math performance was completely re revised with new data. The focus box on gender and computers was completely re rewritten with new research. Chapter 9. All statistics on women employment were thoroughly updated. We added eagerly excuse me, and Carly's concept of the labyrinth rather than the glass ceiling. Chapter 10, we created a new focus box, endocrine disruptors reflecting increasing concern about these chemicals in the environment and increasing research on the topic. We added a new focus box, single sex schooling and the brain. We explain epigenetics and its implementation, implementations, implications for gender issues. The concepts of Neuroplasticity and neurosexism are introduced. Chapter 11, all health and life expectancy statistics were thoroughly updated. We updated a section on cervical cancer and HPV. We updated our coverage of abortion to include new medical methods and a discussion of the politics of abortion research. Chapter 12, we added new coverage of Bancroft and colleagues sexual excitation inhibition model. A new meta-analysis of gender differences in sexuality was incorporated. A section on hooking up was added. Chapter 13, Sue's concept of microaggressions introduced in chapter four is extended to sexual orientation. New data from the US National Longitudinal Lesbian Family Study were added. We added results from a new meta-analysis of victimization of LGB persons. The old stage model of sexual identity development was replaced with Diamond's model of sexual fluidity. Chapter 14, new material on rape prevention programs was added. We added, we 
presented updated research on the effectiveness of treatment for incarcerated rapists. New information on shock arrests for batterers was added. Chapter 15 and then chapter 16, the section on gender and depression was completely rewritten to integrate the ABC model. The section on treatments for eating disorders thoroughly re was thoroughly rewritten based on the latest evidence. He added coverage of a new meta-analysis on media consumption and body dissatisfaction. The APA's new guidelines for psychological practice with girls and women were incorporated. That's chapter 15, chapter 16, the last chapter. New research on stereotypes of men was incorporated. We added Michael Kimmel's new work on Guyland. Guyland. We added Zerbriggen's provocative argument that male socialization is geared toward making boys into soldiers and one outcome is rape. This book talks uh, about many different topics and hits on many different uh, topic and subject areas. Taking the class and engaging in discussions and learning about it is uh, also a, a worthwhile endeavor, in my opinion. Chapter 1, Introduction. The first thing that strikes the careless observer is that women are unlike men. They are the opposite sex. Though why opposite, I do not know. What is the neighboring sex? But the fundamental thing is that women are more like men than anything else in the world. Dorothy Sayers, Unpopular Opinions, 1946. Questions here in this chapter, why study the psychology of women? Topic areas. Sex, gender, sexism, and feminism. Sources of sex bias and psychological research. Looking ahead, suggestions for further reading. One day when my daughter, Margaret, was four and a half, the half was very important to her, she told me, J-S-H, about the games she had been playing at her preschool. She played with her boyfriend, Demetrios. He said he married her when they grew up. They played super friends. She told me that Demetrios chose a character he wanted to be, such as Superman, and then she played the female counterpart, Supergirl. I had to sit down for a minute while processing the significance of all she was saying. She hadn't even started kindergarten yet, and her femaleness and its requirements were so clear to her. She understood that the male chooses what he wants to be, and then she follows, picking up the female counterpart role. She had learned that he is Superman while she is Supergirl. I tried to talk her out of it. <laughs> I said, if he is Superman, she could be Superwoman. She said, there is no Superwoman. Uh, and this book came out in 2013. Uh, I asked her why Demetrios always got to choose what they played. She couldn't pick Wonder Woman, and, she, and he could be... And, and he could be Wonder Man. I guess that would be Wonder Woman. In the, in the, in the movie. Okay, that's right. It's Wonder Woman. Or Wonder Boy. She said it couldn't be played that way. I asked why. She said it just couldn't. After a while, I gave up. Partly for theoretical reasons that would be discussed in Chapter 2. But the point of the story is that gender 
is such an important quality in our society. Even preschoolers understand the social significance of these attributes. Margaret and her friends had already learned, and believe me, I didn't tell her all this, that males choose and lead and females follow. They already understood heterosexuality and marriage as important parts of their role requirements. This book is about being female, what it means in our society, and what it means biologically, and how all of this incorporated into the behavior, thoughts, and feelings of girls and women. Why study the psychology of women? Most textbooks include an introductory section on why people should study that particular topic. Such a section does not seem quite so necessary in a book on the psychology of women. The main reason for studying it is obvious. It's interesting. It is interesting. The questions raised in a psychology of women course are fascinating. Why do women and men interact the way they do? How are women how are women doing in their efforts to combine work and family? Why are more women than men depressed? Is adolescence really as awful a time for girls as we hear in the popular media? Many women take this course because they want to understand themselves better, a goal they may feel was not met by their other psychology courses. Men may take this course wanting to understand women better. Many good practical reasons exist for wanting to study the psychology of women. There are also some good academic reasons for studying the psychology of women. Many traditional psych psychological theories have literally been theories about men. They have treated women at best as a variation of, from the norm. Perhaps the best example is psychoanalytic theory, to be discussed in Chapter 2. Similar, similarly, sex bias has existed in many aspects of psychological research, a point to be discussed later in this chapter. As a result, traditional psychology has often been about men, and it has often operated from very traditional assumptions about gender roles. One way to correct these biases is to recognize a psychology of women. <clears throat> The psychology of women thus provides information about a group that has often been overlooked in research and theory, and it opens up new perspectives on gender roles and ways they might be changed. Finally, one other reason for studying the psychology of women is that the female experience differs qualitatively from the male experience in some ways. Only women experience menstruation, pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding. In addition to these biologically produced experiences, there are culturally produced uniqueness, uniquenesses to women's experience resulting from the gender roles in our culture. For example, in U.S. culture, walking down the street and being the object of catcalls is an experience nearly unique to women. One of the points of the feminist movement is that women need to communicate more with one another about these female experiences. Therefore, a course that provides information on these topics is worthwhile and also gives people a chance to express their feelings about their experiences. Such communication should help women survive and thrive in the female experience or change the aspects of it that need to be changed. There is a paradox inherent in trying to understand the psychology of women, a paradox that is captured in the quotation at the beginning of this chapter. Women and men are at once different and similar. Although gender differences are important in defining women's psychology, gender similarities are equally important. important. Both scientific and non-scientific views of women have concentrated on how they differ from men. This leads to a distorted understanding unless there is equal emphasis on similarities. This, paradox, this paradoxical tension between gender differences and gender similarities will be a continuing theme throughout the book. Hyde, 2005a. Uh, they have a figure A, figure 1.1. The questioning of gender roles in recent years has made us wonder whether men could take on traditional female roles such as caregiving at a daycare center. Uh, 
this is figure 1.2, the female experience is biologically and socially different than the male experience. Both childcare and finding childcare are considered to be women's roles, women's roles. It says, still having problems finding daycare? That picture of one, uh, figure 1.2. Gender similarities, there's a definition here. Ways in which males and females are similar rather than different. Sex, gender, sexism, and feminism. Before processing, <clears throat> before, before proceeding, some terms need to be defined. First, it is worth noting that in our language, the term sex is sometimes used ambiguously. That is, sometimes it is used to refer to sexual behavior such as sexual intercourse, whereas at other times it is used to refer to males and females. Usually, of course, the meaning is clear from the context. For example, if an employment application says sex, semicolon, you don't write as often as possible. In that context, the question clearly is about whether you are female or a male. On the other hand, what is the topic of a book entitled Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Societies? Is it about female roles and male roles in those societies, or is it about sexual behavior of primitive people? That's another definition here. Gender, the state of being male or female. To reduce this ambiguity, we are going to use the term sex to refer to sexual behaviors and the term gender to refer to males and females. Gender differences then refers to differences between females and males. Other scholars have, have adopted other conventions. For example, some scholars prefer to use, this, to use the term sex differences to refer to innate or biologically produced differences between females and males and gender differences to refer to male-female differences as a result from learning and the social roles of females and males. For example, in Unger, 1979. The problem with this terminology is that studies often document the female-male difference without providing any evidence as to what causes it, biology, society, or both. Furthermore, the sharp distinction between biological causes and cultural causes fails to recognize that biology and culture may interact. Therefore, we are simply going to use the term gender differences for male-female differences and leave their causation as a separate question. There's another definition here for sexism. Sexism is another term that will be relevant in this book. Sexism can be de defined as discrimination or bias against people based on their gender. Actually, within our terminology, the term should probably be genderism, but it would not be used because sexism and sex bias are the standard terms. Here, we will be concerned with sexism and discrimination against women. Some people feel uncomfortable using the term sexism because they think of it as a nasty label to hurl at someone or something. In fact, it is a good legitimate term that describes a particular phenomenon, namely discrimination on the ba by basis of gender, particularly discrimination against women. It will be used in that spirit in this book, not as a form of name call. It is also important to recognize that not only men, but women as well, can engage in sexist behavior. Social psychologists have studied sexism extensively, and their research has yielded several findings that are relevant here. First, sexism isn't what it used to be. Old-fashioned sexism, the kind that was prevalent in the 1950s and earlier, was characterized by open or overt prejudice against women. An example would be the belief, common in the 1950s and 1960s in the United States, that women could not be anchors on TV news programs because 
they wouldn't be good at it. And because viewers wouldn't accept the news as authoritative if it were delivered by a woman. Today, of course, news programs often have co-anchors, one male and one female. And the old view seems ridiculous. In short, old-fashioned sexism has been replaced by modern sexism or neo-sexism, which refers to covert or subtle prejudiced beliefs about women. Swim at all, 1995. And my mind uh, automatically goes to uh, one of the, I don't know if she's still one of the current anchors, uh, MSNBC, uh, Rachel Maddows. I think she's a brilliant uh, anchor. Um, psychologists measured old-fashioned sexism items like women are generally not as smart as men. And 50 or more years ago, many people would have agreed with such a statement. Modern sexism, in contrast, is more subtle and consists of three components. Denial that there is continuing discrimination against women, antagonistic feelings about women's demands, and resentment about perceived special favors granted to women. Swim et al. 1995. Even in the 21st century, experiences with sexism are common. In one study of a large sample of girls between the ages 12 and 18, 23% reported that they had been discouraged in math, science, or computers by teachers because they were a girl, and 32% reported that boys had discouraged them in these areas. Leeper and Brown, 2008. Many had also been discouraged in athletics because of being a girl. 28% had been discouraged by teachers or coaches, and 54% had been discouraged by boys. <clears throat> those, those would all be examples of modern sexism or neo-sexism. Psychologists Peter Glick and Susan Fisk, 2001, have demonstrated two other types of sexism today. Hostile sexism and benevolent sexism. Hostile sexism refers to negative, hostile attitudes towards women and adversarial beliefs about adversarial beliefs about gender relations in which women are thought to spend most of their time trying to control them, whether through sexuality or feminism. Benevolent sexism, in contrast, consists of beliefs about women that seem to to the perpetrator to be kind or benevolent in which women are honored and put on a proverbial pedestal. In the benevolent view, women are seen as pure beings who should be protected and adored. Although this view seems harmless, it is still a form of sexism because it views women as weak and as being put on a pedestal is extremely confining, both literally and figuratively. One final term that needs to be defined in this context is feminist. A feminist is a person who favors political, economic, and social equality of women and men, and therefore favors the legal and social changes that will be necessary to achieve that equality. Okay, so I didn't have the definition completely correct, it's not corrected. Feminists generally consider this term preferable to others, such as women's liberty which is often used in a derogatory manner. A wide spectrum of feminist beliefs exist, ranging from those of women in an organized organization who want to improve it to those of radical feminists. Uh, I think I used the term extreme. Uh, these different varieties are discussed in chapter two. Let us now turn to the issue of sexism in research. Uh, let me just keep these short. Uh, the chapter goes on for another 15 pages, and I'll put that in the next video. Thank you.